today. I'm Peter Chef, and besides having three kids that only behave themselves when they're asleep, I work for a company called Atlassian. We're makers of developer tools, and some of our products include Jira, Confluence, Bamboo, HipChat, Stash, and Bitbucket. I'm the team leader of Build Engineering, and I'm going to talk to you today about the great work that my team has been doing over the past three and a half years. I just want to say it's a, a privilege to work with such a great team. To provide you with some context for this talk, uh, the team is responsible for providing a build platform and services that's used internally across the whole organisation. Being a software house, there's a huge appetite for CI capacity. To give you an idea of the scale that we operate in, we run 90,000 builds per month. Jira itself has 43,000 automated tests. That doesn't include instances where we run those tests across multiple platforms, for example, on uh, Postgres, Oracle, and Windows. Developers expect a reliable infrastructure and fast CI feedback. They want to deliver features quickly and safely. When a build fails, they need to trust the results that they receive. They don't want to be slowed down by unreliable infrastructure. In terms of the build infrastructure that we have today, we have about a thousand build agents, a combination of our own hardware of long-running build agents and AWS instances that are spun up on demand. Our build agents require a large amount of configuration to get them into a state ready to perform builds successfully, to cater for the various teams across the whole organization. So we need to install things like SCM clients, like Git Mercurial, Subversion, various versions of the JDKs, various versions of Maven, Gradle, Ant, databases, MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB, headless browser testing, so Firefox, Chrome, VMs support, Python, Node.js builds. Then we also need to be able to generate installs of our products. And then all the credentials and configuration that goes with all that. We maintain about 20 AMIs of various build permutations of the required build configuration. For example, the different uh, versions of the databases. Given that we dog food our products internally, all, our, all of our product teams use Bamboo, the Atlassian's continuous integration server, which allows you to build, test, and deploy your code. We run eight instances internally. We also look after the Maven in infrastructure, include, including maven.lassian.com, which under the covers is six Nexus instances. Then all the monitoring um, that goes with all that. The lesson is expanding at a rapid rate, so providing this ever-growing platform continues to be a challenging problem. So you can see on this graph here, this has been going crazy, and it's only going to get worse. So we've been looking after builds over this period of time, and uh, it's just going to be a continuing challenge. So what does it mean to be practicing infrastructure as code? Just as a show of hands, who's using Puppet here? Awesome, I'm at the right conference. Does using Puppet and having your Puppet code checked into source control enough to tick the buzzword checkbox? I believe it's just the beginning. I'll take you through some of the challenges that we've faced and the practices that we've implemented along our journey. Four years ago, we were manually maintaining snowflakes. We were dealing with machines that were in an unknown configuration state that would be extremely difficult to rebuild from scratch. Then we started to use public. A developer requested a new version of the JDK to be installed on all the agents. And we pushed the change, and it broke all the build agents that were under public control at the time. But the change didn't just reduce the capacity of the small build grid that we had. The dodgy push resulted in every build failing on those agents. We were providing a platform that was producing build failures that was infrastructure related. 
This is not the situation we ever want to be in. Developers have a hard enough time getting their automated tests to run reliably without any flakiness, let alone having infrafaders come and spoil the party. We can live with a reduced CI capacity, but the capacity that we make available needs to work. To make matters worse, the rest of the team wasn't aware that the change was being pushed and what the change actually was. We had a problem. We had a low confidence of change. We weren't confident that the change would work and we weren't confident that it would break anything else. So if you think about a particular infra change being developed and rolled out over time, we had very little confidence that it would be successful until it hit production. But even then, we weren't very confident. This is obviously a very subjective graph, lots of time side bias, but please bear with me. So I was scared when puppet changes would go out. I wanted something better than this. I wanted to know about the failures before they hit production and impacted developer build results. Just as a show of hands, who's using Subversion still? The whole bastards. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first improvements that we made was that we moved from Subversion to Git. We moved to Bitbucket and started using branches and pull requests as a lightweight code review tool. By using pull requests, it encourages the team to create smaller, more manageable chunks of change. It also encourages peer review and the team talking about their code, which resulted in an increase in code quality. <coughs> we started a team convention of obtaining two approvers before merging a change to master. Then we started getting comments about coding style issues coming up in pull requests. This is something that can be automated. Humans need to think about high-level problems when performing code reviews. They shouldn't be worried about coding style. So Tim Sharp has written a tool that performs automated style checking of public code. We set up a bamboo build that performs these checks and posts the results. We set the build up, the build up in such a way that it's a ratchet build. So if the number of warnings or errors increases, the build fails. So because we added the code review process and style checking, it gave us more confidence of change. Another area of improvement was, the, was our use of the public staging environment. We were using a handful of agents in a public staging environment to develop our changes on. Make, manually make the changes to those agents, then puppetize the changes by hacking away at the puppet master. This caused staging machines to drift <coughs> off actual puppet configuration, as not all manual changes made it into puppet, and promoted a culture of the, within the team of modifying production instances manually and not keeping everything in puppet. This goes totally against our need for a consistent build environment Every agent needs to be the same, so when a build fails, it's not attributed to any differences between the agents. Rebuilding the agents from scratch at the time was very difficult, so it was very rarely done. These, these machines were still being used for production builds, as this was our only way to validate our changes. And unfortunately, it resulted in build failures when the changes weren't successful. So who knows about Vagrant or is using Vagrant? Awesome. So Mitchell Hashimoto has written a tool called Vagrant, which allows you to spin up your infrastructure locally on your laptop. It handles the complexity of configuring the VM, including the network and shared folders, and comes with a plugin framework that allows you to extend the provided functionality. It allows you to create reproducible, disposable environments. Machine provisioning can be done via VirtualBox, VMware, AWS. The configuration can be applied by simple shell scripts, Puppet, or Chef. It allows you to start with a known configuration state, develop and test your infra changes locally before committing to SCN. 
<coughs> so to spin up the VM, just run vagrant up from the command line. A vagrant file that contains the configuration that describes the type of machine required and how to configure and provision it is ready, which is checked into source control together with your project so that everyone is developing from the same known state. A vagrant base box or box is required as well. It's a platform dependent bare machine that Vagrant uses as the starting point for its provisioning process. So you can check out the source code of your project, run Vagrant up, which brings the VM up to the known state. Then you can make your public changes in your favorite editor, and run Vagrant provision, which will run public apply within your VM. You can then SSH to the VM, and confirm that the changes are successful. After you've committed the changes to SCM, you can then destroy the VM. It's that simple. We've been using Vagrant for three years now. It comes with a number of advantages. There's no need to use the real agents. Staging can actually be used as a staging environment. There's less risk of configuration grief. It's definitely worth checking out if you haven't already. My team wouldn't be able to function without it. And because the team started to develop their changes locally using Vagrant, not only significantly improved the overall confidence of our changes, but also improved the confidence early on in the change process. We find out about problems sooner rather than later. As we started to use Vagrant, we noticed, di noticed differences between Vagrant and our production environment. The biggest difference was between the vagrant base box and the bare machine or VM being provisioned in production. We were using publicly available vagrant base boxes which had differences between the packages that were installed between them and production. So unfortunately, and unfortunately generating a base box at the time was a painful process. Nowadays, we use a tool called Packer again written by Mitchell Hashimoto, which is a tool for creating identical machine images for multiple platforms from a single source configuration file. In a fully automated process, it takes a configuration file, which you've checked into source control, downloads the required ISO, spins up VirtualBox, performs the OS installation, and installs all the required vagrant dependencies and configuration. This same configuration file can be used to provision an equivalent image for AWS, VWeb, VMware, or a stack of other, other platforms. Running the same commands across all platforms, which could be Bash, Puppet, or Chef. In our use case today, we use it to install the minimum number of dependencies required to run Puppet, and we burn an image for VirtualBox and AWS as our base box. We also use it for a, another scenario of doing our very same AMIs for the build grid, but that's a separate story. We have this generation of the Vagrant base box in a bamboo building. This ensures that we have an up-to-date base box that is made available to the team for their local development. By putting this process into a build, it also ensures that it's a repeatable process and we receive notification when it starts to fail. For example, an external package is no longer available. We find out about it immediately, instead of when we discover we need to actually rebuild the base box. Because we use Packer to generate the base box, bringing it closer to production state, it gives us slightly more confidence for a change. So we're developing our changes locally, using staging as an actual staging environment, rolling out to production, but we're still getting regressions. We especially notice this when we'll go to provision new instances of the build agents. While developing our changes, we would manually make the changes to the VM, check that it worked as expected, and then puppetize it and check again. But we didn't have any confirmation that we'd broken anything else in the meantime. 
So we started to use Cucumber and behavior-driven development, which fo focuses on asserting the expected behavior of the system rather than how it is configured. For example, confirm that a particular command line tool is working rather than asserting that the package is installed, which is the first example. Or another example is a test that conf confirms that the Nexus web front end is reporting that it's correctly licensed as opposed to checking that the license file is on the file system. So to practice BDD, you write the test of what you would expect, run the test and see it fail, write some other code, apply that on the machine, rerun the test and see it pass. This allows for automated testing of changes locally within Vagrant. This not only confirms that your changes have been made successfully, but it also identifies regressions for you in the future. <coughs> to hook our Cucumber tests into Vagrant, we wrote our own custom provisional plugin, which on provision would run Puppet Apply and the Cucumber tests over SSH as part of the provision process. So every time Puppet runs in Vagrant, we get confirmation that all our regression tests pass. There's actually an open, open source plugin, data plugins available now, so if you want to do this, certainly look them up and check it out. This does come with a couple of disadvantages. It requires the Cucumber dependencies to be installed on the test VM. And because you're running the tests within your VM, it makes certain scenarios harder to test, for example, firewall rules. Because we added behavior-driven development into the change process by introducing Cucumber, we significantly improved the confidence level of our changes. Then we heard this in the team. <laughs> so we started to provision our infrastructure from a bamboo build. <coughs> When a pull request would get merged to master, a build would be kicked off, would perform from scratch provisioning, i.e. starting from a very vagrant base box, running puppet apply, and then running all the cucumber tests. This gives us confidence in not only sorting out integration issues between members of the team, but also confidence that you can rebuild in a disaster situation. If there's a problem, with the provisioning process, you'll find out about it immediately and not during the disaster. Which brings me to a bit of an overused quote um, from Tim, Burn, Tim, Tim Bell of CERN, who defined two categories during his keynote at PubCon 2012, pets and cattle. By being able to reprovision your infrastructure easily and quickly from scratch, it allows you to treat your machines like cattle instead of pets. If your machine starts misbehaving, you have the option of destroying and rebuilding from scratch without wasting your time trying to nurse your pet back to health. You can also make sure that machine configuration doesn't drift over time by shooting your cattle regularly. <laughs> This is especially important for consistency across all the build agents. I know it's an overused quote, been Luke mentioned it this morning, but it really resonates with me. So by adding continuous integration into our public infra change life cycle, we've significantly improved our confidence in change. The next problem was that from scratch provisioning was slow. We started by spreading out the provisioning process from a sequential order to paralyzing the provisioning across multiple bamboo jobs. The benefit of this approach was that it not only reduced the overall provisioning time, but it also highlighted unintended dependencies between the VMs, which led us to the next problem finding enough machines to run the puppet CI on. These are the ones I had my eye on. 
building a large macro grid wasn't an option, so we had to look elsewhere. So we started by profiling our puppet runs. We did this by updating our vagrant, uh, custom vagrant provisioner plugin to pass the eval trace option to the puppet apply call, and then collect and show the log messages with the longest times. Similar to running the cucumber tests, we profile our public runs as part of every vagrant provision. By doing this, it highlights problems during development of our puppet changes rather than later, later on down the track. We also added profiling of our cucumber tests, allowing us to concentrate on improving the longest running tests. It also allows us to question the value of those tests. Do we really want to wait one and a half minutes for this? SBT to be confirmed. Um, if you want to do what we did, you can copy and paste the code to get this functionality from this URL. So that wasn't enough. So we introduced the concept of delta provisioning. As part of our CI builds, we would export successfully provisioned VMs to a file share and use that export as the starting point for our delta provisioning. In this way, Puppet only has to apply a small difference of changes rather than go through the long process of provisioning from scratch. We set up our vagrant file in such a way that by providing an environment variable, the correct base blocks would be downloaded for either from scratch provisioning or delta provisioning. This significantly decreased the time for people to bring their laptops up to the last known good state, ready for them to develop their changes on. It also picks up a different class of problem. For example, you might be able to provision your, a machine from scratch successfully, but applying the same public configuration to an already provisioned <coughs> machine might fail. Delta provisioning picks this problem up. This is important as this approach more closely matches production. This provides us with more confidence that our change will be successfully rolled out. So by adding Delta provisioning, there is more confidence of change later on in the input change process. Then we're faced with broken builds. The problem we had was that the CI was only available for changes after it had been reviewed and in a pull request and merged to master. This created a long feedback loop of fixing a build. You need to make the change locally, get it reviewed, and annoy your team, team members, having to re-review some code that, that wasn't successfully rolled out or didn't even pass CI. You get it merged to master, run the CI build, and check if it actually got fixed. So broken build result in an inability to deploy to production. Your pipeline or production line is effectively stopped. It's not a situation you ever want to be in. This became a, a bigger problem as the team grew. So we started to use branch builds. This is functionality provided by Bamboo, where it automatically creates, runs, and destroys branch builds based on what branches you had in your repository. So in this example, we have two feature branches where you can commit and push your changes and confirm that they're working before they're actually merged to master. This provides you CI in isolation without impacting master. This results in a significantly more stable master besides occasional flaky build. With the addition of branch builds, you get much more confidence in, of change, much sooner in the change life cycle. This confidence comes at a cost though. We have to run the build twice, at least once on a branch build to confirm that it's green before merging, and then after we merge to master. So this is especially a problem if you have slow builds. A large part of why the builds were slow 
with the limited capacity that we had of our Mac Pros, we couldn't get enough of them to run all our branch fields on. So actually, I got into a little bit of trouble. So I would act, it got so desperate that I would be watching out for people leaving the organization, finding out what day they were leaving. Then I would wait until they leave, leave the building, grab their machines before the IT team got their hands on it, <laughs> bring it back to our team, reprovision it, and get it onto the grid. So that worked a few times until the IT team caught on. And uh, I got into a little bit of trouble, and I was told I had to stop. <laughs> so we had to look elsewhere. I was just trying to unlock my team. So we moved our public pipeline from using VirtualBox to AWS by using the Vagrant AWS plugin. So this came with a number of advantages for us. Obviously, the Mac Pros were no longer required. And in all honesty, they, they were quite, quite old and slow. So we actually got a 50% reduction in build time just by moving to AWS and not depending on this old hardware. And the only limit that you have, besides the occasional AWS capacity limits that you might get, which we have yet, but you know, it's generally just limited by the credit card limit that you have. So we went on a bit of a sprint, spending spree, and our credit card started to bounce. <laughs> so we stood back and realized that most of the changes coming through our pipeline didn't change a lot of our nodes in our puppetry. So we gained a saving in time and money if we didn't provision the nodes that didn't change in our branch builds. So the Puppet Master has the ability to spit out a compiled catalog of a particular node. This has all the information required by Puppet to bring a node up to the expected configuration state. By sorting elements, and removing timestamps, you can come up with a deterministic SHA-1 that represents a node. By using this te technique, you can then generate this hash for master and branch and quickly determine whether your node has changed in your branch build. So in this first example, of a random hash that I generated, um, they're both the same. So there's no need to provision the, this particular node in our branch build. In the second example, the hash is different. So we definitely want to provision the node in our branch build to confirm that it works. This gave us a huge saving in both time and money. But please don't ask us. Ask me how much we've been on AWS. So the, for the past three and a half years, we've been using Kanban within the team to visualize our work. By putting limits in place, it allows us to identify bottlenecks in our flow and work on resolving those bottlenecks. We noticed a bottleneck in our rollout process. It was due to infrequent releases of our puppet changes, which resulted in larger changes being rolled out. With that comes larger failures. The infrequent releases were due to puppet rollouts being painful at the time, so the team would batch them up. The main cause of the pain was that puppet runs could impact running builds. If a build agent had changed during a puppet run, the service would be restarted, causing any currently running build to fail. So to avoid this, the team would disable all the build agents, perform the rollout by doing the usual git clone, my brand puppet install, symlink dance on puppet master, manually kick off puppet on all the agents, confirm that it was all successful, and enable all the agents. To make matters worse, we had a puppet environment for every bamboo server, so these steps had to be repeated multiple times. The problem was that the notifiers of our file resources 
which would force a restart of the service. When Puppet runs and changes the file resource, it tells Daemon Tools to restart the service, killing any currently running build. To solve this problem, we changed the service definition of the Bamboo agent to create a touch file when it needed to restart, actually restarting the service as part of the Puppet run. And we wrote a Bamboo plugin to watch for this touch file and gracefully shut down and restart when it came to night an idle stage. What I like about this approach is that it only requires a service definition change. References to notify don't require changing, so there's no need for anyone in the future needing to do anything special for graceful restarts to, to work when you're writing their file resources. They just continue to use the standard approach of calling notify. Mm. So with the introduction of graceful restarts, we no longer needed to have a separate puppet environment for each bamboo server. So we're able to have one staging and one production environment. But we're still manually updating the puppet tree on the puppet master. So we're still going through git cloning, library puppet installs, symlink update on the puppet master. It wasn't fun, it was error prone because a human was doing it. So we created a bamboo build which performs the above steps automatically. So the bamboo build would check out puppet tree, run library and puppet install, create a package which is then used during testing and then upload to the puppet master. The staging symlink is automatically updated when all the tests go green and the production symlink is a manual staging bamboo that can be kicked off by the click of a button when we're ready to deploy to prod. This was especially useful when we were performing a data center migration where we had to keep multiple puppet masters in sync. Another problem area was the number of pull requests that we had in flight to review and merge. We love our automation, so we wrote a bot that polls our repositories for open pull requests and provides useful information like the number of approvals and the, the, the build results of the branches so that we can quickly determine what needs reviewing and what needs to be merged. So with less human interaction and more automation, gain higher confidence until things go wrong. With less human effort, we get an increase in release frequency. With the addition of the more frequent releases, it gave us more confidence of change. Three and a half years ago, I was scared of puppet changes going on. But more recently, I caught myself thinking, should I be scared? Given that we've added all these tools and processes to improve our confidence, I shouldn't be. To get over this irrational thought, we added hip chat notifications on deployments. So when things do go wrong, we can quickly determine whether it was related to the deployment and go back to the diff of changes to determine what caused the problem. By adding notification, it gave us more confidence of change in the rollout process. So when we first started, we had a very low confidence of change. So all the things that we've improved, we've increased that confidence. What's important here is that we've not only significantly improved our overall confidence of change, but we've gained that confidence early on in the change lifecycle process. Confidence in change, or finding and fixing problems sooner rather than later. I want to know about the failures before they hit production and impact developer build results. So over time, we've made the transition from machines that were snowflakes in an unknown configuration state to pets that were under puppet control. 
to cattle that can be rigged off from scratch in production. The next phase that we're currently working on is the move to stateless machines. At the moment, we have long-running build agents. So we get hit by misbehaving builds that impact subsequent builds that run on the same agent. What we're currently working on is using Docker to create and destroy containers on a per-build basis to ensure that every build starts in a known configuration state so that the build can run in, in its own real universe, isolated from everything else. <coughs> So this is a small part of what we do. If you're interested, please come and join us. We'd love to have you on board. <coughs> and uh, one more thing. Um, who's using Sonotype Nexus here? Oh, oh a couple of you. Uh, so we had the problem that we will maintain the Nexus XML file um, and we're fighting over, over control between Puppet and the Nexus instance. So we created um, and recently open sourced a uh, public module that handles the configuration of Nexus instances via the REST endpoint that Nexus provides. So there's no need to um, uh, there's no need to manage XML files via Puppet. You've got these nice Puppet um, custom custom resources that we've defined that you can use and under the covers called REST. So if you're using Sonotype under public control. Encourage you to check it out. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, do you have any tips on managing investment software in the kind of automated environment that we have this time? <laughs> Grab me out for a couple of minutes and I'll, I'll give you an honest <laughs> decision. Okay, uh, what, how do you manage the Western software with flight public? Uh, that's hard. Um, uh, I think our problem is that we do things that are very specific for our environment, so open sourcing them doesn't make sense for what we do internally. Well, when I say we, I'm talking about my team. Um, so the Nexus hub um, modules are like a first step in creating modules that we could actually public, actually publicly put our names on. Um, we wouldn't necessarily put our names on what we have to do with everything else. So I don't have good advice. Grab me after a couple of years and I'll give you more honest. Assessment of the situation. <laughs> but uh, just to answer, I mean, just to add more to his question, yeah. uh, in the Puppet Force module, I have used the uh, Jira stash. Yeah. There are modules which are uh, already available, and I have used that. I am using both modules. So it is being managed by Puppet. Sure. Turn that video camera off. Look, it, it all wants to, you know, I'll be honest, it would be great if. Amazon came out and said, hey, here are some modules, we're supporting them, uh, you know, um, but that's not... Yeah, yeah, okay. Good. Hey. Um, that workflow that you demonstrated has seen had quite a few moving parts. Yep. Is that something that you guys designed from the beginning and then worked towards, or was it one piece at a time along the way? No, nah, it's just at one step at a time. I guess uh, I skimmed over a lot of the details, I guess. Um, when we first started, a lot of the builds were sort of separate builds, um, and you know, we'd do the font scratch provisioning as one build, Delta as another, Public as another, um, and then oh, and our AMI pipeline as well were all separate builds that we would um, just sort of come up with and develop and get to a state that we'll be happy with. Only very recently, probably the last three months, that we're comfortable enough to have everything in the one build, one pipeline, um, and that's just taken a very long time. And it's just a matter of getting, it, um, getting the build into a reliable state before saying to the team, this goes red, you need to fix it, and you can't push it to work out. So it does take time, um, and we didn't necessarily have the vision of where we are today back then. Um, it was just incremental. 
Yep. Um, your graph constantly showed um, a comparatively low uh, confidence in development and an increasing confidence in production. Was that just because it's of bullshit. a nice graph? Right. <laughs> I was just trying to make a point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's, 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 that's,